Good evening. Uh, welcome to Winchester Road Baptist Church. So glad you're here. It's Christmas season. We're going to start singing a couple of Christmas songs. So at this time, I'd like to ask you to go ahead and stand with us and join us as we sing. Christmas and all that it means for us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It's the time to celebrate what God has done for us. We're glad to see you tonight. Good to have you here. We're going to have a great time celebrating uh, Jesus and looking at the Word together tonight. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father God, as we do come before you tonight, we do thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And Father, you're with us in difficult times. You're with us in the highs and the joys of life. And we thank you that your, your presence is sure and steadfast and your word is also sure and steadfast. And so we come before you trusting in you, trusting in your word tonight and looking to you and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Father, we know that at this time of season, it is a time for joy for the believer, but it's also a time when there's a heartache and difficulty for many others. And we pray, Father God, that... During this time, Father, we would be your, uh, your spokespersons in our world to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and the salvation that is found in you. Father, thank you for your presence tonight. 
as we worship you. And it's in that wonderful name we pray. Amen. So sing this song with us as, as we as we begin. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we live. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether the skies will rain, I know that you are good. This is the day. 
is the day. Come and sing your praise, for the Lord now reigns on the throne of grace. Soon is the day he will bring us home, and we have this hope, for we are his own. This is the day. song's a little bit new, so join with us as we sing Help Us Out here.
shining brighter than the sun on that day. We will know you as we lift our voice as one till that day. We will praise you for your never-ending grace. We will keep on singing on that glorious day. On that day, we will see you shining brighter than the sun. On that day, we will know you as we lift our voice as one. Till that day, we will praise you for your never-ending grace. We will keep on singing on that glorious day. We will keep on singing on that glorious day. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13. We're continuing our study in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 13. I want to begin reading in verse 1. The scripture says, As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones. What magnificent buildings. Do you see all of these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked Jesus privately, Tell us, what will be... The thi what will, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and you'll be flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at that time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, we've just been talking about that. We've been reading that. We've been seeing that, and we have on Sunday mornings in our series on the signs of the time. That's uh, the cross-reference, as we would say, to Matthew 24. But here we have uh, the Gospel of Mark recording some of the same things, but also there are some other things, and we're not going to repeat everything that uh, we've talked about in our series in Matthew 24. We'd be in it a long time because our series in Matthew 24 has been going on. We'll hit some of the highlights as we come to this in our study in, uh, of the Gospel of Mark, but there are a few things that I want to talk about uh, in this passage that we haven't so much talked about uh, in our signs of the time. Uh, so we'll be looking at some new things uh, tonight and, and next Wednesday night. But this is a conversation 
that Jesus had with his disciples as they were leaving the temple in Jerusalem, and they're walking back, remember, to Bethany. Bethany was just a couple of miles away, and it was where generally Jesus spent his nights when he was in the area of Jerusalem and Bethany. This is occurring probably Tuesday afternoon or either Wednesday afternoon of the week of his crucifixion. This is, I believe, the last recording uh, record that we have of Jesus visiting Jerusalem or the temple in Jerusalem. And one of the disciples comments about the beautiful temple facilities and how magnificent they are. And this leads to Jesus' prophetic statement concerning the fate of the temple. It's a prophecy that he speaks concerning not one stone being left upon the other. And as we have said in our previous study, that this did happen about 40 years later from when this passage occurred in roughly 770 A.D., the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem. And then one thing I don't think we talked about very much in our study in Matthew 24 was a little bit more about this temple. And I, I think it's helpful to, you know, for us to understand things and the settings of, of passages. You're the Wednesday night crowd. You like digging into a little more detail about things. Well, remember... This temple is the second temple that's been built at, at this spot. The original temple was built by Solomon around 965 B.C. Uh, Solomon's father, David, King David, had wanted to build the temple for God as a place where uh, the Ark of the Covenant would dwell, the presence of God would be evident. But as you remember, David was... Uh, forbidden to build the temple because, as it said in Second Chronicles 28, verse 3, you will not build a house for my name, for you are a man of war and have shed blood. So God did not allow David to build that temple in Jerusalem. Instead, uh, David's son Solomon would build the temple, and um, he would build it on what we've talked about a little bit in our series, on Mount Moriah. And so this new temple that Solomon built uh, replaced the portable uh, tabernacle that the Jews had or Israel had as they traveled through the wilderness you know, and they moved from place to place. This would be a permanent temple or a permanent resting uh, place for God's presence. Now, kind of as an interesting fact about that temple that Solomon built there were no loud noises of construction, no cutting of the stones that were used in the build, the massive stones that were used in building of the temple. None of that was done. No sound of hammering or chiseling was done on site of the temple. We're told about in 1 Kings 6, 7, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7, that all the hammering, all the cutting of these stones were done at the quarry and they were moved actual to the temple site. It was an indication of the holiness of the site of the temple, that no loud noises of the chiseling of the breaking of the stones were to be made. And actually this is, a, when you think about it, an incredible, we'd call it an architectural feat, that these massive stones, some say weighed hundreds of tons. It's hard to even imagine stones and how they moved those stones to the temple site. But this is what was used in the construction of this temple of Solomon. Some people have said that the inside ceiling of the temple was 180 feet long, 90 feet wide, and at its highest point, it reached up to 20 stories high. It's a massive structure. 1 Kings chapter 6 through chapter 8 describe the construction of this temple, the details that went into Solomon's temple, and also the dedication of the temple. This temple that Solomon built, not this one in Mark 13, but the temple that Solomon built was the center of Jewish life. It was the center of worship for about 900 years, I mean 400 years, and you remember what happened to it. When the Babylonians invaded 
in 586 B.C., it was destroyed. The temple that Solomon built was destroyed. And you remember many of the Jews were taken off to uh, Babylon into captivity. They remained there until Cyrus, of the, per the king of Persia, uh, defeated the Babylonians, and he allowed some of the Jews to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And they started by laying the foundation, but when you read uh, about the passages regarding the building or rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, there was a lot of obstacles, there was a lot of opposition. The foundation was laid, and then when they got the foundation laid, it just lay there. I think it was 17 years that the foundation laid and, and no more work was done. But then by the urging of Haggai and Zephaniah, it restarted. Zerubbabel uh, began construction on the temple in about 520 B.C., and it was completed, at least that phase of the temple was completed about five years later in 515 B.C. Now, this temple, some people call it Zerubbabel's temple, but this second temple, temple it was very modest, or again, it's probably the best way to put it, uh, compared to Solomon's temple. It was not near the size nor the grandeur of that first temple, and it was very disappointing to many of the Jews. In Ezra, chapter 3, verse 12, it says, But many of the older priests and the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple, Solomon's temple, wept aloud when they saw the foundation laid. So you can just imagine it. And some of them come back to Jerusalem. They're expecting the grandeur temple of what they remembered, some of the old folks, and they come back and it's just this little ditty foundation laid. And they said, this is nothing like the former temple. It doesn't have its glory, it doesn't have its splendor. It said they wept aloud, they wept bitterly. So this temple was not as magnificent structurally as Solomon's temple. And so Haggai prophesied concerning this second temple. And he said, one day this temple would be more magnificent than the previous. Remember when we, you maybe remember when we studied through Haggai, we talked about this, and he said this temple, in fact, it's in Haggai 2, and it talks about it in about verses 3 through 9. He said, for the, de the desire of the nations will come to this temple. And because the desire of the nations, which is a, a title or designation for the Messiah, because of his, that he'll one day come to this temple, it's magnificent. And the glory will be greater than even Solomon's temple. And Haggai's prophecy came true about, what, 500 years later. And Jesus himself came to the temple. And this is where we are in the passage right here. Where Jesus comes to this temple, the second temple, that when it was originally built, wasn't very magnificent, but uh, when Jesus came, it was. Now, this second temple even though I said it was built kind of small in comparison to Solomon's temple, it did go through some reconstruction or some expansion, a couple of them. But the most notable, particularly for uh, in our study in the Bible, was during the reign of uh, King Herod. In about 20 B.C., he decided that he would expand the temple. The, many of the Jews were still kind of grumbling this long later about the temple not being like it was when Solomon, although they had not seen it, they had heard stories of it and the grandeur of it. And so King Herod decided he would expand the temple, not because he was interested in uh, Israel's God, but because he wanted to be in good with the people and because it helped if, if they... Uh, didn't revolt against him. And, and so he wanted to do this in order to get in good with the uh, Jews. And so he started an extensive expansion of the temple. Some people say it was even larger than the original. And he gave it a f updated or a facelift or whatever you want to call it where it was beautiful. It was magnificent in this expansion. So in this passage in Mark 13... 
the disciples are walking through the temple property. They're seeing the buildings and the expansion that has taken place. Uh, some people think it was still being expanded in some, some ways in some areas. But it, it's like they are still amazed at the transformation and how the temple has expanded and how beautiful and how glorious it is. And so they say, teacher, can you just believe? Just look at this. Just look at this temple. You know, just look how grand it is. Just look at the size of these stones. And all of these things, as the temple gets to this place now, this second temple, where it, it has been expanded and, and uh, updated and made even more beautiful, uh, makes what Jesus said more shocking, certainly for the disciples and hopefully us, as then we've kind of learned a little bit more about the temple where Jesus said, I tell you that not one stone will be left upon the other for they will all be torn down. This temple will be destroyed. And the disciples, those that heard it, they, they no doubt were shocked at what he would say and stunned by what he would say about this temple. And finally, about what they wanted, and, and now he, he says it's going to be destroyed. So uh, some of the prophets, as we talk about where we are, we mentioned this a little bit in, in some of our other studies, particularly also in Mark, some of the prophets had warned about the destruction of the temple as a result of Israel's disobedience and rebellion against him. And remember, in, uh, against God, and remember in Mark, we have seen several incidences, uh, particularly um, in um, chapter uh, 11, uh, where Jesus confronts Israel or speaks to the situation of Israel and the religious leaders concerning their fruitlessness, their rebellion against God. They're misusing the temple. Remember, uh, he came into the temple. He looked around, saw the things that were taking place. He went out, went back to Bethany, came back the next day. Then he uh, turned over the tables of the money uh, changers, and you remember what he said? You have made the house of God into a what? Den of thieves. I mean, we talked a lot about what that meant, the den of thieves. Uh, the den was not where they conducted so much the, um, the uh, crimes or the uh, uh, disobedience to God, but it was speaking of how they were using uh, God and their positions as priests and representatives of God as a cover for what they were doing, for taking advantage of the people and actually spreading that which was not true, but spreading that which was false. So as a wild animal would go into his de de den after he would kill his prey and seek cover in the safety of his den, the religious leaders of Israel were going to the temple and covering themselves in the cloak of re religiosity and piety to do the evilness of uh, leading the Jewish people further away from God rather than uh, close to God. And then, remember, uh, as they were leading, leaving the temple, there was the fig tree, or as they were coming to the fig tree, uh, coming to Jerusalem. Jesus cursed the fig tree because he said it had leaves, but it had no fruit, and it should have fruit because it had leaves. And then when they came back later that afternoon, the fruit tree, the fig tree had withered. And remember, we talked about Jesus was explaining this, the significance of it, as it spoke as a prophecy concerning Israel. They looked good. They had the appearance of being followers of God, but there was no fruit. There was no fruitfulness of God uh, for God in Israel. Uh, they were rebellious. They were not obedient. They were not productive for God. And God warned, uh, Jesus was warning, as this fruit tree has withered, so Israel will wither. And this was a prophecy of what he said even now in referring to what he said now concerning uh, the temple. The temple 
being destroyed. So, in our passage in verse uh, 3, it says, Jesus sits on the Mount of Olives, which is, he says, opposite the Temple Mount. So he can look across, as this discussion, you can just imagine them looking across the valley over to the Temple Mount as they're sitting on the Mount of Olives. And the four disciples, it says here, four disciples ask him, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, uh, it was Peter's brother. They're, they're the first disciples Jesus called, but they're here and asking him about this. When's all this going to take place? And when's the end of the age? What are the signs of your coming? When will these things happen? And so, in response, Jesus speaks of certain things that will occur. Now, again, we've talked about a lot of these things on our study. Uh, he talks about false prophets. There'll be false prophets. There will be false teaching. There will be false Christ, those claiming to be the Christ or the Messiah. There will be deception. People will be led away by deception. He talks about wars and conflicts, famines and destruction. He talks about persecution against Israel, the people of God, and as we would say today, against Christians. And on and on, all these things uh, are, are, um, we, we've talked about in, in Matthew 24. But I think we've, we've, we've hinted at this, but many of these prophecies that Jesus is speaking or many of these signs that Jesus is speaking about is like many of the Old Testament prophecies are. You know, where we said they are, are a, a double prophetic. They have a near um, application or fulfillment, and then they have a later fulfillment uh, or a more full, ultimate fulfillment. And this is true with many of these prophecies. There would be uh, destruction. There would be destruction of the temple. That was one application of what he spoke. But then there would also be a further destruction coming uh, and devastation coming. There would be wars. There would be rumors of wars. And we talked about how these have been all through history. But there will be an ultimate war, the war at the end of the age, the battle of Armageddon. And so all of these things that he speaks of have multiple fulfillments, as in birth pains, but leading up to the ultimate. And these prophecies, I don't believe, are necessarily in chronological order. Sometimes people need to put, want to put them in chronological or order. But then we see, as we've talked about in Matthew 24, Jesus appears to say, when you see all these things, or the generation see all of these things coming about, that will be the end, or the end will come. And so we say there's a coming together of these prophecies, not so much as a chronological order of this one happening, then this one happening, and then this, was ha this one happening. So Jesus speaks of all these things, and uh, I want to just kind of tonight just give a few, four, I think it's four, uh, kind of summary statements about what we've talked about on Sunday morning and also in this passage. Uh, number one, or maybe application, don't be surprised or disturbed by what takes place in this world. Don't be surprised. Don't be disturbed. Several times in this passage, he says, watch out. But he also says, do not be disturbed. He says, do not be afraid. He's telling his disciples some, what we would say, are disturbing things, are fearful things. But Jesus tells them, do not be afraid. Do not be Verse 5, don't be deceived. Verse 6, don't be alarmed. And verse 9, be on your guard. So Christ says, don't be surprised what happens in this world. You know, uh, sometimes, you know, I see things taking place, and I thought, I never thought I'd see that in our world. Jesus said, don't, don't let it knock you off. Don't be surprised what takes place in the world. These things must happen. These are the things that will take place. So don't be surprised. Don't be worried. Don't be disturbed. You know, Christians, kind of as another aside, Christians, of all people, have reason not to be disturbed by our world. Why? Because our foundation is Christ. Our hope is in Him. And so, you remember, there's another passage in John, is it John 16, where Jesus said, In this world you shall have, what? Tri trouble or tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. 
So our hope is in Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is seeking sand. So one reason we study these end time things so that we won't be surprised by them. We won't be disturbed by them. We won't worry about them. But it will increase our standing in Christ in what he's promised and who he is. So the first thing is, don't be surprised by the things happening in this world as we get closer to the coming of Christ. Don't be overcome by or overwhelmed by them or worry about them. That's the first thing. Secondly, and we've, we've talked about this several times on Sunday morning, is be ready. Be ready for the end times and Christ's return. So there are a couple of things we're to be ready for, and he says this again several Be on your guard. Watch out, he says. All those imply being ready. Two thing, first thing we think of being ready is being ready for his return, and that's certainly true. But the other aspect of giving all of this, things that will happen, is, is he's saying be ready for these things to happen. Be ready for these troubles to come. Now, again, how do you get ready for troubles? Well, it's hard to get ready for troubles when the trouble hits. Have you ever noticed that? You know, a lot of times something will happen, go, oh, no, i got to find a verse right now. You know, how do you find a verse? You know, give me a verse to get through this. You know, verse a day, get the doctor away. The way you prepare for troubles is being prepared for troubles, right? You prepare yourself. You, you become strong in the Lord. You have a firm foundation in the Scripture. You saturate yourself in the Scripture. You know what the Word of God says. So you're not surprised. You're not troubled or caught off guard. You strengthen yourself in the Lord and the power of his might. So you, you be ready. You prepare. You be ready for his coming. You be ready for whatever this world brings. You're ready. And then third, and we mentioned this, uh, I think, last Sunday, the Sunday before last. I want last Sunday. That was the children's program, Sunday before that. And that is endure. Endure. We are in it until the Lord returns. We're not in it for the short run. We're, in the, we're looking for the Lord to come. And we endure. We are of the people who endure. We don't spring up and then when the um, heat comes or trouble comes or hardship comes, we fade away and die. Or when the, the drought comes, we endure. We're like the tree planted by the, st the streams of water, streams of water, that when the winds come, the storms come, the drought comes, our roots are deep. And so we endure. We endure through the difficulties. We endure in the hardship. And how do we do that? Looking unto him who is the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the suffering, even death upon the cross, for the joy set before him. So we endure. Even as we go through difficult times, even go through hard times, we endure because we're looking unto Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's close tonight in prayer. Father God, we do thank you for your word to us. We thank you that your word is our sure foundation. It is the basis of our hope. It is what we trust in. And because we trust in you, Father, we're looking for your coming again. And we seek to be ready. In your name we pray. Amen. Stand with me as we sing our song of commitment. So glad you're here tonight. You know during the month of December, 
We uh, have a special offering for our international missions, our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It's an offering we take up to help spread the gospel around the world, to help support missionaries. Uh, we sometimes go, sometimes we pray for them, sometimes we send them, and we're to give financially to encourage them and help them. So if you'll be seated, we have a little short video concerning this offering, and we encourage you to uh, be prepared to give. And if you designate, just designate on your uh, check or your envelope Christmas offering or missions offering. So we'll make sure it's correctly designated. We hear it in the voices of the hurting. We sense it in the brokenness of the world around us. Lostness is a blindness to the promise and hope of the gospel that leads to eternal separation from the Father. The world's greatest problem is lostness, and it's growing every day. Eight billion people living in 195 countries speaking over 7,000 languages. Today, more than half have yet to hear the good news of the gospel. The vision God gives us in Revelation 7-9, a multitude from every nation, all tribes, peoples, and languages, fuels our desire to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. But we must be willing to go further than we've ever gone before, to the very edges of lostness, where more than 3,000 people groups have no missionary presence and likely no access to the gospel. No one is engaging them. Together, we can change that. We know the love and hope and peace of the gospel. We know the way, the truth, and the life. We know the power of true redemption. We will not ignore lostness. We will not be silent. We will not stand still. From the Great Commission until the Great Multitude, we must unite in this great pursuit to reach every nation, no matter the cost. Amen. If you would, stand with us as we sing our closing song. Thank you. 